So there are some certain things she will do that will make, first of all, your progress easier and faster. Meditating. Meditating. How do you meditate? You take a scripture or you take one thing and then you churn it in your mind. You stay on it. You expand it in your thoughts. You dwell on it in your thought. And then as you dwell on it in your thought, it expands you. It expands you. And you do that repeatedly as often as possible in a day. Not for one day, not for one week. For as long as it takes. Listen, you cannot make significant progress without practicing the art of meditation. Without intentionally engaging your mind. Imagining the outcome before it happens. Just like a woman cannot conceive except she engages in intercourse. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. The same way you cannot bet what you have not conceived. You can't bet a future that you have not first of all conceived. You have to Re- or preplay it again and again. Imagining. Imagining. That's why God said in the scripture we read last week, Genesis 11 says, there is nothing they have imagined that will be restrained from them. There is nothing they have imagined. You have put, engage your mind, your thought in. It's like a story of Two people we are told to cut down a tree. And then the first person, you know, took the cutlass and he sped off. He started cutting. And then, you know, he made quite a bit of progress. The second man didn't even move. He didn't move. While the first guy sped off to the forest to cut down the tree, the second man stayed back. Now, what they didn't know was that he didn't just stay back. He was sharpening the axe. They were given one day to cut down the tree, massive tree. He was sharpening his axe. He spent the first one hour sharpening the axe. And then by the time he got there, the first guy had already gone quite a a distance. And then he started. Halfway, the other guy discovered that his, he was exerting more effort, but the tree wasn't moving. He decided to exert more effort, but the tree wouldn't answer to him. This other guy was just enjoying himself. He kept cutting. And after cutting for a few hours, he took off again. One hour time, he came back. And he continued to cut. And then eventually he brought down the tree. The guy who started first failed to meet the target. That's how it is. Many of us rush into life without sharpening the edge of, of the axe. The Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes, I think chapter 9 or so, that if the axe is blunt, you are going to have to sweat and struggle to use a blunt axe. Now, in this context of what we are talking about, we, are talking, it, we can relate it to imagination. We rush into life. We rush into marriage. We rush into relationship. We rush into, you know, our, our business. We rush into everything without spending quality time To brood on the success. To brood on the successful outcome. To meditate. To visualize. To preplay repeatedly the success. And then, we rush in with a lot of energy. And of course, you know, within the, the first season, as it were, it seems like we are making progress, but after a while, the progress stalls. And we don't understand why. 
And what do we do like that first guy? We put in more effort. We put in more energy. We try to hit harder. But the harder we hit, the more we struggle without results. And what could have made a lot of difference according to this scripture and many other scriptures is to discipline our mind intentionally to meditate on the outcome that we want to receive, especially based on what God has promised. Imagine the outcome, your successful outcome. Visualize it. Engage your mind. What do you want to see? God said there is nothing they have imagined that will be held back from them. Not there is nothing they have worried about or there is nothing they have wa- wanted in quotes. Life doesn't necessarily answer to your wants, no matter how genuine they are. In fact, life doesn't answer to your needs, no matter how genuine your needs are. Your needs can be very, gen- it can be even noble. You want, you want to make money so you can give to the poor. It can be so noble, but life doesn't respond just to that. There are laws governing creation. There are laws governing every aspect of human life. In fact, the most fundamental law, basically, that applies to almost everything is the law of sowing and reaping, seed time and harvest. Now, it doesn't only apply to finances, even though finance is a major factor, but it applies to every area of life. What you put in is what you get out. What you put into your mind is what you get out of it. So how do you know, how do you measure what you've been putting in your mind? Just look around you. Look around you. If your life, sadly, if your life is full of misery, I'm telling you, the law states that you have been putting, meditating, imagining that over time. You have been meditating on it over time, unconsciously in most cases. Those drifting thoughts, those uncontrolled thoughts, what if I go for this exam and I fail? What if they sack me? Those, those thoughts, what, what if I'm not able to make enough money to sustain my business? Rather than meditating on the outcome you want to see, most often I know what we do is to meditate on the outcome we fear. Find out from Job what happened eventually. Many people have asked this question. If Job was such a righteous man, how come God allowed him to suffer that bad? So much disaster to one person in one day. He lost all his children in one day. Lost all his wealth in one day. Lost his health in one day. What happened? How come God allowed it? The answer is from the lips of Job. Job said, the things I feared greatly has come upon me. The things I feared. What he was saying is that the things I've meditated on for so long has finally happened. Has finally happened. I meditated on, oh, oh, I hope, I hope my children, all of them won't die one day. I feared it. I meditated it. I internalized it. I imagined it. The things I imagined or I feared the most has happened. So many times we blame God for nothing. Things happen to people and we blame God. You don't have all the answers. You don't have the answers. Oh, why is this person like this? Now considering all the things, you know, how he's serving God or how she's serving God and giving so much to God and all that. You don't know what the person 
In fact, even the individual himself or herself, in some cases, don't even know what they are doing. That is creating that result. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. In one day, but for God, who told Satan, you cannot touch his life. In one day, Satan had permission to wipe out every other thing by Job's invitation. The things I feared, the things I dreaded, the things I imagined could happen has finally happened. What are you imagining? What are your consuming thoughts? What are your most dominant thoughts? Your life will always move in the direction of your most dominant thoughts. Most dominant thoughts. And that's why you've got to be conscious. Listen, in this life, nothing just happens. So, so I, I mentioned this in the first service. When you see people who are far ahead of you, never ever attribute their success or achievement to luck. If you do that, it's either born out of ignorance or envy. You must admit that there's something they know that you don't know. They may not know every other thing more than you. You may even know much more than them in a lot of area. But there's something, even if it's just one thing, they know that you don't know. And, and interestingly, that thing is a critical success factor. It's not enough to know everything. You don't even need to know everything. Just know a few correct things. I mean, what's the essence of cramming a whole chemistry book, textbook? When the lecturer is going to bring out the quiz from just one chapter. And then you cram everything. Rather than focusing on mastering that one chapter. Let me tell you, it happened to me. Oh, positively. <laughs> when I did my my work, I didn't do very well. And I was shocked. I mean, I was I was shocked. Even in subject where there were about two or three, two subjects where I was the best in my set. I didn't do well in them. I was shocked. I mean, I took the result. I couldn't believe that. I said, this cannot be mine. One of them was geography. Another one was chemistry. And then Bible knowledge. I remember one day in our final year in secondary school, our principal, who was a Bible knowledge teacher, called the entire set to his class. He gave me cane to flog everybody. Because of, of the, all the tests he gave us, I was the only one who passed it. And yet, I didn't pass. I was angry. <laughs> and I decided, you know what? I will prove that this result is not fine. <laughs> Praise the name of Jesus Christ. Again, I didn't take it back home. I just posted, posted until it was forgotten. Praise the Lord. Who is having that China phone? It sounds like China phone. It's a compliment anyway. China is one of the biggest IT. I don't like the way people laugh in this church. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, so when it was time for the next week, one of the courses I decided I was going to crush was chemistry. I didn't read chemistry textbooks from chapter to chapter, no. Somehow, I just had this, that wisdom. I decided to go get past questions, five years in a row, all the, I concentrated on past questions. 
focused my attention. Dealt with it again and again and again until that was all I did. I went to the exam hall. I went arrogantly. Because I, I went 30 minutes late. Everybody else was in the class. I just strolled in. <laughs> well, of course, you know, I wasn't born again, so, and I had a reputation in that school. And I was living up to it. <laughs> so I just strolled in, took my answer sheet, question paper, and started walking. I finished with everybody. And when I finished, the material came, looked at my sheet, he tried to set me to be sure that there was nothing fishy. And then looked at my answer. He was also a chemistry teacher. And he realized that it was, you know, um, impeccable. You know what he did? He took another answer sheet, gave it to me, and he begged me to copy the answers for his nephew. Yes. Now, of course I did. Because if you don't, you might, you might throw your answer sheet away and say, it's, you know, <laughs> I did. I came in 30 minutes late, finished for everybody, I still made an A. Now, I'm just, talk, you know, talking about the power of focus. You don't need to know everything. You don't need to focus on everything. Master. You know what Paul said? He said, this one thing I do. This one thing I do. Let me tell you one of the, one of the, one of the um, deception that Satan has used to rob many people of their success. It is the guise, the deception of multi dexterity. It looks like a strength, but it's a weakness. I can do everything. Some people even back it up with scripture. I can do all things. And then at the end of the day, you lack focus. When you mention certain names that are prominent, you always attach them to one thing. Michael Jordan. Whiskey. Football. Table tennis. What? Music. Really? Is that the only thing he can do in his life? But he has focused on it. Buari, no, I didn't mention that. <laughs> it was a slip of. No, I. It, it. Praise the Lord. At least people know him more than you. He's more popular than you. Right? But he's popular for something. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The power of mastery. Focus is the power of mastery. Want to gain mastery? Learn to focus. Learn to focus. Focus your imagination. Focus meditation. Focus meditation. When your mind wanders here and there, many things, is fragmented, you can't gain mastery of life. You can't gain mastery of life. You have to discipline your mind. To master the art of focus.
What did Jim Collins say about, about disciplined thoughts? You, you, can't, you can't engage in disciplined action without disciplined thoughts. It starts here. As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. In other words, what you see manifest already first of all happened in his thoughts. Nothing just happens. Nothing just happens. I mean, it's like somebody who come who goes for deliverance repeatedly. Say, I don't know, I'm just, you know, I just I have a compulsive, you know, desire for sex. And yet he watches porn. And then he goes for deliverance. Who is it deceiving? Because there is a feeder. If you don't cut off the feeder, you can't deal with the action. You can't deal with the action. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. So Paul said to his son Timothy, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely or wholly. Soak yourself in it. Whoa, soak yourself in it. Why? He said, by so doing, your progress or success will become visible to everyone. Tell your neighbor, do you want to make significant success? Do you want to enjoy visible progress? Meditate. Now, some of you have heard this before. Some of you have even heard it in some other places maybe 10 years ago. You didn't take it seriously. Why? You wanted quick action. You wanted, you wanted success now, 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 now. But it's been 10 years. It's been 10 years. The success hasn't happened now, 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 now. And yet, if you are disciplining yourself to practice this principle, not only would it have come, but it would have come and it would have been sustained with peace of mind. With peace of mind. The greatest battle you'll ever fight is upstairs. The greatest battle you ever fight is upstairs. The greatest strategy any, your enemy with Satan would deploy against you will be the battle of the mind. He tried to mess up your mind. We try to give you things to think about. Because he knows that once he can control your thought, he controls your life. Oh, look at the, the parable Jesus gave in the book of Matthew, I think 13. One of those parables about the, soul, about the uh, man who sowed good seed on his ground, on his farm. And then when he came back, he discovered that in all manner of things you are growing. And he said, an enemy has done this. Now, what did the enemy do? The Bible says the enemy came and sowed tears. When he sowed tears, God opened my eyes to see this one day. When the enemy sowed tears on that farm, he didn't wait. The Bible says he sowed tears and he went away. Why? Because he knows that once I can sow it, it will germinate. And once it germinates, it takes over. That's how the enemy does. He knows that once he can fire the thought, and give you what to think about. He doesn't need to stay with that individual. He will travel somewhere else. Because that thought he has sown, that thought he has deposited, will ruin that person's life. It can be thought of failure. It can be thought of disappointment. It can even be thought of envy. It can be thought of bitterness. 
All these things are more dangerous than cancer. The enemy knows that once I can sow it, I don't need to hang around. They'll be fighting unnecessary battles. Satan, I bind you. It's not there. It's in Kaduna. He only sowed the tears and left. Because he knows the tears will work. As long as you have received it, there is something already going on. There is a germination process that has been set in place. Which is designed to ensure that every area of that individual's life is mortgaged. That's why the Bible says, casting down imagination. Give me that scripture and I'll end with this. Glory to Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse, verse 4 and 5. No, give me verse 4, please. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Sadly, the only strongholds we are taught growing up as believers are demonic strongholds. Demons. So, you spend years dealing with demons. And then somehow, it occurs to you that ah, if it's just demons, I've used the name of Jesus, I've used the blood of Jesus, I've used anointing oil, I've used holy water, I've consulted intercessors. I've gone for breaking of yoke. I've gone for feet washing. I've used mantle for 10 years. Then suddenly your eyes begin to open that there must be something. That's for a few people. Sadly, for many people, for the rest of their lives, except by mercy, God brings them in contact with this revelation. Your eyes begin to open that there must be something I'm not doing right. Because if it's just demonic stronghold alone, they should have given way. Satan does not have what it takes to resist the name of Jesus. He doesn't have what it takes. I can tell you that by, by the word of God, by personal experience, after, I mean, over three decades of working with God, I mean, he started deliverance to people regularly. In the name of Jesus, he's out. I mean, it's asked someone a few days ago, and a few days later, I was asking her, what happened to you? And then, I mean, she went on and on and on, the testimony, the, the things that left her, the experience she's having right now, like, Wow. I didn't know life can be this good. And in a, a tap of a finger, a few minutes. Satan does not have what it takes to resist the name of Jesus. So when you have applied all those things and it seems not to be moving, then you know that there must be something else. This is where it comes in. There is another type of stronghold that we often do not teach about, which is the most prevalent stronghold that believers deal with. It is the mental stronghold. Strongholds are things that are designed to confine and restrain an individual to a spot to ensure that that in person does not move. It's like a prison, a jail. A person can see through but can't move beyond that jail. That's a stronghold. Now, but it's invisible. It's not visible to the eyes. That's a stronghold that most people often battle with and they are not aware. And that's why, you know, they are fighting the wrong battle, dealing with, in quotes, spiritual strongholds, 
that are not really, really there. So they keep dealing and bombarding and bombarding and bombarding. Some even go into some dramatic kind of prayer. Satan, in the name of Jesus, I shoot you. I mean, I've seen that. I've seen people pray like that. Some of you have prayed like that. You've gone, you've been in places where they pray, taught you to pray like that. Satan, in the name of Jesus, I use bazooka. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Not only bazooka. If I let me tell you what will be happening, demons will just be giving themselves high five. <laughs> it will be like comedy to demons. I don't understand what your bazooka is. You see bazooka in the Bible. Not only bazooka, it's, it's chewing gum. This is the main stronghold that more people battle with than not. It's a casting down imagination. Take it back. Give me verse 4 again. Give me verse 4. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But mighty true God to the pulling down of strongholds. What are the strongholds? Next verse quickly. Casting down imagination. Imagination. The strongholds that has been built to encycle the individual and limit that individual to a spot. To determine how far the individual can go. You can't go beyond this limit. Casting down imagination. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, still in the realm of the mind. Still in the realm of the mind. Casting that imagination and, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. What are those things? Those things that are contradictory to the word of God in your life. That's what he's talking about. And then, and bringing into captivity every thought. To the obedience of Christ. You bring every thought. Those are the strong goals. Limiting thought. Thought that confines. Thought that limits. Thought that places limitation or you know, restraint to how far the individual can go. That's the real strong goal. And God says deal with it. Take care of it. How do you deal with it? You don't deal with it by, you know, using bazooka. You deal with it with the word of God. You deal with it by meditation on the word of God. You deal with it by meditation on the word of God. That's why, that's why, now, I gave some examples in, in the first session, the first service, which I might not have time to go into. Our time is already gone. Now, that's why somebody can be, can have an encounter, spiritual encounter you are prayed for. Then suddenly there is a radical shift in your situation. You see a result, and it seems like that result is short-lived. You know why? Now, there was a force, supernatural force, that broke certain limitation, which made you see a result. But unfortunately, you didn't dismantle the stronghold that have been built over time by way of that negative experience. Because one of the things that negative experience does is that it builds strongholds. When you have failed a few times, if you don't take time, you begin to have the mentality of a failure or the failure mentality or expectation to fail. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That applies also when, you, when you've been in lack for a while. Or when you are, if you are born in lack, the, you, the major battle you will have to contend with is not the witches that came with you from the village. No, it's a stronghold that has been built over the years by that lack you grew up in. That's what the enemy will use like a rope to hold the individual back. That's a stronghold. Until you dismantle it, that individual cannot go far. Even if the person is experiencing a breakthrough, right? Without dismantling that stronghold, the breakthrough may be short-lived. The person will make certain wrong decisions. 
that will bring that person back. I mean, it's been proven time and time again. Most of the people who win the lottery in America eventually go broke in one year. Some of them were on the street. They win a $5 million lottery. And then they begin to live a large life. In one year, they are back on the street begging with no homes. You know why? They made money, but they didn't change the mentality that created the poverty. That's what happened to the Jews. They left Egypt, but Egypt didn't leave them. They left the land of slavery, but slavery did not leave them. They still had the mentality of slaves. That's why they could not enter the promised land. You can't enter the promised land with the mentality of a slave. So you have to deal with that mentality, first of all. You have to dismantle. How do you dismantle it? It's, but Paul said in Romans 12, 2, they be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? By meditating on the word. Now, I'm not talking about you are reading the word, you, are, you have all the distraction around you. No! It cannot work. Or you are listening to messages and you are doing a thousand other things at the same time. The, it, it is not entering your spirit. It's not, it, you, are, you are not concentrating so I can clean up and wash. You got to be focused. You got to be intentional. You got to be intentional. I mean, in case you don't know, you are one year older this year. So you ain't got no time to waste. Somebody may be asking, Pastor, okay, can I recover the lost years a thousand times? Yes. That's what quantum leap is about. A thousand times, yes. God can... I mean, I told someone some time ago, I said, listen, this thing you are stressing yourself over, it looks like impossible, and you are at the point of frustration, almost, God forbid, suicidal. I say, in a short while, in a short while, you look back and wonder, what was I stressing myself about? I said, just stay on course. And the person was like, is it possible? What you are saying, is it really possible? I said, don't worry, just stay on course. The person was telling me recently, he said, you know, when you were saying it, I, I, I just didn't take it. He said, but now I'm ask, actually asking myself, what was I frustrated about? What was I going to give up about? Why was I feeling so exasperated like, you know, this thing cannot work? I told the person, that's how life is. And I told you what I told you by two things, based on the word and by benefit of experience. Nothing is as difficult as it seems to be. We